I'm the executive director of the Theodore King Foundation, and um, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm saying I'm kind of really sorry that we're having a series <laughs> on fire. I mean, oh, well, I guess we could have had it proactively, but of course everyone's busy, so we can it reactively. Um, so what we, we wanted to do was put the fire, okay, first, we all have to tell our fire stories, right? So the fire, you can see the hill, not this hill, which is wildfire hill, but the next hill over burned. And we were here when the helicopters and the planes and the firemen on the ground and all the different kinds of technology that they use and the amazing skill the firemen had fighting the fire. So once, um, like middle of the next week when we realized probably it was okay, we were going to burn down so many spot fires. We really needed to, to react and respond to the fire. The Theodore Payne Foundation is an organization that exists to promote California native plants. And after fires, there tends to be, um, I think, quite a reasonable reaction to people who want to stabilize slopes. This is like the first thing. They want to stabilize the slopes above their houses, and they want to help. They want to help the environment. They want to help the plants. They want to help the animals. So what we thought we'd do is have a series of lectures and classes that are around these topics to help us help in an in a informed way. So we're inviting scientists and educators to address the community. And we also thought it's a really good time to do some free things for the neighbors, It's like because we all just went through this pretty traumatic experience together. I was talking to fire professionals yesterday and saying, Lily and I are, are like, when we drive through the canyon, we will choke up, of course, because it's, it's pretty sobering. And, and John's like, it's not I feel that way when I see it. He's like, well, it's my first fire. So I feel like I could have an emotional, there's still an emotional response. I'm still in their emotional response uh, level. But we're getting a little better as days go by. Um, so we're kicking off, before we start, I wanted to introduce Vickery Murphy, who's here representing um, Anthony Portantino, Senator Anthony Portantino's office here. <laughs> during the fire, actually, during the fire, I uh, had previously been using social media, but I became a real believer during the fire. It's like, wow, this is a great way to communicate. Um, all these people know what's going on, and they're putting all this information in there, and it's sharing. And Vickery was one of the people who's paid, whose post I was relying on, so I want to thank her for that service to the community. Um, so today we're starting off with Dr. John Healy. Uh, John has a PhD in ecology and botany from the University of Georgia, an excellent organismal biology department um, that I happen to know about. Is a new organismal biologist. Um, he's a, been a professor at Occidental for 20 years. He's right now a research ecologist at the uh, United States Geological Service. He's also an adjunct ecologist at UCLA, and they're in ecology and evolutionary biology, and the Institute for the Environment and Sustainability. He's the <laughs> and Southern California Fire Science Consortium, and has spent uh, his career doing, doing a com combining things, which is research and science, but also communicating it to non-scientists, the information about research and fire ecology, and communicating it to non-scientists. So I'm really, really pleased and honored that John is here to kick us off today. Uh, we will be taping, um, we're recording, uh, this lecture, so we'll post it so if you want to um, circulate it more wi widely, you should know that, but you should also know that it's being recorded, so if you don't want to be recorded, best to stay on to that side. So, thank you, Don. You're welcome. Thank you, Kitty. Uh, I have to say, it's the first time I've been introduced by saying uh, that uh, they regretted this series, but <laughs> I uh, I see the reason for being a bit concerned about this event. These events, when they hit close to home, are always uh, uh, perhaps hit you a lot harder than others. 
I was uh, happy to, to uh, respond to Kitty's request for a talk uh, because uh, my history with TPF goes back a very long time. I met my wife here at the Leo Payne Foundation. Uh, she was a manager at the time, and I came and I bought a bunch of plants and I took them home. And to this day, I don't know whether it was accidental or intentional, but I left one of them behind. <laughs> so I had to come to call her up and, uh, well, the rest is history. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about today is sort of an overview of the ecology of fire in Southern California, give some perspective of how to see the, these events in terms of their impact on the environment, and then go into management questions about how to deal with these issues, raise a lot of topics. Uh, we have an hour and a half. I was planning on talking for half that time, and then leave the other half for questions uh, and discussions. But if you have any questions as we go along, go ahead and, and uh, uh, interrupt. I have uh, taught for 20 years. I'm used to that. Now, if you look at this background picture here, uh, for those of you who live in Southern California, uh, I often think of that as sort of a typical autumn day in Southern California. <laughs> uh, we get these catastrophic fires, and people actually make fun of it. I love this uh, page in the uh, Onion News where they talk about how <laughs> annually gather to celebrate the wildfire tradition. And, and the uh, residents uh, feign a shock that's going to happen with them. And, Thousands of homes are burned every year. In fact, since year 2000, there's been on average a thousand homes a year lost in California from wildfires. So it shouldn't be any surprise what happened. Now, there's a lot of talk about fire in the media, and, and I think it's important to put Southern California in the context of California and the Western US. This figure here, uh, through the years, um, the orange shows the amount of area that's burned in the Western US. And the red shows the amount of area burned in California. California doesn't dominate the western U.S. in the area burned. But what it does dominate in is the amount of money that's spent to fight wildfires. And that's seen here. This uh, red here indicates the amount of money that goes to fighting fires. So we don't have the most area burned in the West, but we certainly spend most, uh, the most money on fighting those fires. And a lot of it has to do with the high population density. Now, it's important to understand that California is a very large state, has the largest latitudinal gradient of any state in the western US. And so it's very problematical if you're going to talk about fire and just talk about California, because fire is very different depending on whether you're in the north uh, or the south. And there's a lot of differences between the north and the south. The northern part of the state tends to be dominated by conifer forests. The south tends to be dominated by Shrubland's population density is uh, radically different, about an order of magnitude more people in the south than the north. And in terms of fires, this is just the numbers of fires on average over a million hectares of land in the north per year versus the south. About a quarter of magnitude more fires in southern California than in northern California. Yeah. What's the 99%? And the percent here is uh, you have a characteristic just like my wife. She was asking a question just before I'm about to say something. <laughs> the parentheses here uh, are the is the percentage of fires that are started by people. When you're in the northeast part of the state, much of the fire emissions are due to lightning. Get down to uh, Southern California, and 99 percent of our fires are started by people. So very different fire regimes in these two landscapes. And as a result, we've had very different impacts due to fire management. This is a study that the Forest Service did a few years ago. And what they did is they asked the question for all the forests in California, if we look at the amount of burning over the last 100 years, how does that relate to what we think the historical frequency was? The blues indicate areas that have had fewer fires in the last 100 years than we believe historically was the case. The yellows and oranges indicate areas that have way more fire than historically was the case. And so the, the big difference between the north and the south is in northern California, there's really been a deficit of fire in the last 100 years. In the south, there's been an excess of fires in the last 100 years. And it's important to keep that in mind because the media, when they talk about fires, they're very often talking about forest fires 
a landscape where there's a, a deficit of fire has altered things. And that doesn't apply to Southern California. And the media seems to have a very hard time getting that message uh, across. Why do you not have data for these big white parts? Well, this is just U.S. Forest Service lands. Okay. It was a project done by the Forest Service. But the patterns are more or less the same north and south. You get out of the forest and it's pretty much the same thing. Many more fires in the south than in the north. Now, it would be useful to explain the difference between north and south so that you can understand how to interpret what is said in the press about fires. In the northern part of the state, where it's dominated by forests, historically they had a very low intensity surface fire regime that burned in the understory of the forest and left most of the forest intact. Very different fire regime than we see in the southern part of the state. Chaparral fires are crown fires. They burn the entire vegetation. And they burn very differently. And a good illustration of this, I lived in uh, Southern California most of my career. And I remember countless uh, wildfires in this part of the state where within hours those fires can devour tens of thousands of acres. You get up into the northern part of the state where they have this surface fire regime that's very different. I remember when I first moved uh, out of Southern California to the job I have now, which is in Sequoia National Park. And it's mostly dominated by forests that have these low intensity surface fires. Uh, we had a lightning storm come through the park in July. And I got a memo in my email, and it's from the fire management officer, and he said there were 13 fires that started in the park from the storm. Let's meet tomorrow to decide what to do about it. <laughs> That's not the reaction. <laughs> it's that these fires burn very slowly in the understory. They're very easy to put out. And as a result, the fire management policy of suppressing fires in the northern part of the state has been highly successful. It can be equated with fire exclusion. And we can illustrate that with data that has been collected, not just in the Sierras, but all over the west in forests, from fire scars on trees. This is a, a, a fir tree here. And you see this scar at the base. That's a fire scar. It's from the surface fire burning through the forest, scarring part of the tree, but leaving the rest of it intact. If you cut through that and look at it in cross section, what you see is here's the scar, but you also can see previous scars from previous years, and you can age those scars, and you can find out what the history of fire was. We have in Sequoia, we have records going back 2,000 years showing the fire history in those forests, and we know that fires have been very frequent in the past. This is a way of illustrating fires in the uh, Sequoia National Park. Each of these horizontal lines indicates a tree. Each of the vertical hash lines indicate a fire event. And then these are the years down here. And what do you see? You see lots of fire events historically until about the late 1800s. And then there's simply no more fire. And that's because the fire managers were putting out fires. They were highly successful. And the suppression policy basically can be equated with fire exclusion. So that's why the forests look very different in terms of their fire history than Southern California shrublands. Now, one of the reasons that um, managers are concerned in Sequoia National Park, this is a big issue, is if you've excluded fires for 100 years, you have an accumulation of dead fuels, and you can change the fire behavior. And this is illustrated here in a picture of a forest fire. This entire scene burned. The foreground here burned in what we think was a more natural surface fire. Uh, where it burned in the understory, maybe killed pockets of trees, but by and large, the forest survived. The background shows an area where there was total crown fire. Everything burned up due to this 100 years of exclusion of fire and fuel accumulation. And so there's a big effort to restore fire to those forested systems. Now, when we get to Southern California, it's a very different landscape. We don't have trees. We don't have fire history uh, records. We have big crown fires. But what we do have is lots of written records on fires uh, over the last 100 years. And this is just the area burned on a long scale to give you the magnitude of burning <coughs> each decade since 1910. And what you see is in these three Southern California counties, there's been constant burning every decade since 1910. We have had the same fire suppression policy 
We just simply haven't been able to exclude fire at all. And in fact, if you look at the amount of area burned here, it's about one third of the county every decade. Which means on a 30 year rotation, <laughs> we're burning the entire county or the equivalent of the entire county. And so the history of fire has been very different on our landscapes. It has to do with the fact that we have chaparral, we also have Santa Ana winds, and we've just never been able to exclude fire on our landscapes. Now, and this is basically, just to go back to this figure here, this basically describes why we see in the last 100 years a deficit of fires in the forest and excess of fires in Southern California. Now, when we see a burned area of uh, uh, vegetation like in the Latuna Canyon fire here, it's pretty much denuded and it looks like essentially a moonscape and people say this is a total catastrophe and the vegetation can't recover, but it turns out that's not the case. These systems have evolved over millions of years along the fire and they have lots of methods for recovery. This is what the Latuna Canyon burned area is likely to look like next spring. It's likely to bring up very, very quickly and it's because there's lots of different strategies that plants have for regenerating. Now, it might be useful to give you an overview of these plants for those of you who may not be familiar with uh, the chaparral plants. This is chamise or adenostoma, probably the most ubiquitous shrub in California. It almost mirrors the distribution of chaparral with the exception that it's very cold and tolerant. And so it's pretty much absent from the interior northeast of, of the state. Uh, another one, my favorite plant, which is manzanitas, has this beautiful red bark that peels off, uh, has flowers that are usually occur in the winter, beautiful pink or white flowers, and then it produces these great uh, little brown red fruits uh, that look like what? What do they look like? They look like little apples, which is where it derives its name. A manzanita is diminutive for apple. And I heard a ranger once say that Indians in California could go for three days eating nothing but manzanita berries, but they could also go four days eating nothing at all. And that <laughs> tells you what's in a manzanita fruit if you've never tried to eat one. There's not much to it, although there is a little sweetness to it. If you suck on it, you can get a little sugar out of the manzanita fruits. Uh, and then, of course, the other important genus in the state is Ceanothus. We have blue flowered ones, white flowered forms. The Ceanothus and Arctostaphylus are two of the uh, <coughs> biggest genera in California, shrub genera. There's something like, depending on the taxonomy, 60 to 70 species in each of those genera. Very unlike all the other genera of shrubs in Chaparral. The rest of the genera have maybe one or two or a few species, but these uh, two genera are very diverse. They've obviously adapted to this landscape very well. Now, in addition to chaparral, we also have uh, another lower growing vegetation we call sage scrub. Uh, some folks will call it coastal sage scrub, others just call it California sage scrub. It's a lower form, tends to have lighter colored foliage. Very often it's drought deciduous, so it loses its leaves. Things like salvias uh, are common sage vegetation. When you look at the Latuna Canyon area, you have actually a mixture of both sage scrub and chaparral vegetation. Now, how do these plants recover after fire? <clears throat> Most of the uh, genera in the state, or at least all the genera, all the shrub genera in chaparral and sage scrub, have species that are capable of re-sprouting from the base after fire. This is a chemise shrub here, and there's this swollen burl at the base, and that houses what we call adventitious buds. Those are buds that are waiting to uh, grow, and they grow once there's some, the suppressing effect of the shrub is gone. Basically, the shrubs produce a, a hormone called loxin, which is transported down the stem and suppresses these. You burn off the tops, it's no longer suppressed, and they sprout. <coughs> uh, sage scrub, we have Things like Artemisia, Salvias, they all are capable of re-sprouting. Some, like this uh, Encelia californica, actually will spread by underground rhizomes and sprout. So a lot of these species will be present in the spring, right after fire, from these re-sprouts. 
Now, in addition, we have a lot of uh, species, particularly in the genera Arctostaphylus and Ceanothus, uh, and then also Adnosula. There's only a couple species of the Adnosula genus. But these species are interesting because they have co-evolved along with fire to the point where they produce seeds more or less every year. But those seeds do not produce seedlings. The seeds go in the soil, and the ones that aren't eaten by animals will stay dormant. And we have good evidence that they can stay dormant for a century or more until fire comes along and it triggers their germination. So in the first spring, you're going to see lots of seedlings of certain species, like Ceanothus, Arctostaphylus. Um, in the Latuna burn, I'm not sure we have many Arctostaphylus. I don't even know if we have any Arctostaphylus. Yes, we do. You do? Yeah. OK. Uh, but certainly we have Ceanothus. And they have dormant seed banks that have now been stimulated by the fire to germinate. Now, species in Chaparral can be divided into different strategies that they have evolved for dealing with fire. There are some, like all the oaks, are what we call obligate re-sprouts. They connect only from re-sprouts. You won't find any oak seedlings uh, next spring uh, in uh, the burns here in La Tuna Canyon. Then we have different Arctostaphylus species, some of them like Arctostaphylus glandulosa. Uh, this one here is re-sprouting. Uh, both re-sprouts and produces seedlings. It's what we call a facultative seeder. It's capable of seeding, but it's also capable of sprouting. But then we also have some species of Arctostaphylus that are obligate seeders, meaning they simply don't re-sprout. This is the skeleton of an Arctostaphylus flocka. They're simply not going to re-sprout. And so they're entirely dependent upon seed germinating after the fire to persist on the site. And this is just an illustration of how closely tied their reproduction of these species is to fire. These are different Ceanothus species. And these are the numbers of seedlings here produced after fire. But just focus on this, which is the percentage of seedlings of these species in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth year after fire. What you can see is that recruitment is all restricted to the very first year. So in the first year, you'll see a burst of seedlings. And then after that, the seed bank's depleted. You won't find any more seedlings until uh, the next fire. Now, that's just part of the story in terms of what's going to happen after fire. You're going to uh, uh, see a really uh, incredible wildflower display after these fires because we have many species of wildflowers that also have dormant seed banks. And those seed banks also require fire to uh, trigger germination. And we have a lot of different species of these post-fire herbaceous species that come in. And there's a, the thing about these post-fire herbaceous species is they're pretty site-specific. So you go to one site, and you'll see lots of facilia. You go to another site, this is uh, uh, Dicentra has a different name now. What's Dicentra been changed to? Somebody maybe can correct me. But it has a new name, at any rate. Uh, and Lotus Scoparius, also a new name. Aquaspawn. Yeah, they came up with something you can't pronounce. <laughs> Aquaspawn. Um, and then Eucryptin. I think it's still Eucryptin. Uh, so every site you go to, you're likely to see a different assemblage of species. So they're not just evenly spread across the landscape, they're fairly site specific. So each of these species have different requirements. And they like the uh, shrubs. Okay, now I don't know how to go backwards. Oh, that makes sense. Now, the, these, uh, yeah? Quick question. The chemicals that are used to actually put out the fires, does that interfere with the resprouting and the regeneration of the seed bank that's already? No, there's really no evidence that it has any sort of lasting effect at all. The only potential effect it would have is there are uh, minerals in there that could act as a fertilizer, but relative to the fertilizer produced by the ash, it's probably of no consequence. So it's not really an issue. Um, now, one of the things to note about these post-fire 
uh, herbaceous species is just like the uh, C. anothus species we saw. When you look at their recruitment by year after fire, they are very heavily restricted in these first two years after fire. And some of these, like this uh, Allophyllum, Calendrinia, Edamanthi, they're annuals and they produce seeds and then those seeds will go dormant and we see little or no germination for the next three years. You won't see any germination of those species until there's another fire, even if it's 100 years later. So they restricted the post-fire conditions and you don't see them again until the next fire. Now, not all of our herbaceous species are this restricted to fire. Some of them, like the Eminanthe I mentioned, Benzalia, Thessalia, uh, this uh, papaver, fire poppy, uh, are what we call pyroendemics because they are like what I just described. They're there in the first year or two after fire, and then pretty much you don't see them again until there's another fire. And this just shows year after fire and the numbers of these uh, that are coming up. These are what we call fire endemics or pyro fire, pyro endemics. They basically are restricted just to fire. Now, not all species out there are strictly tied to fire. We have a lot of things uh, like a number of lotus species uh, that are what we call opportunistic. They'll be very abundant after fire, but they may pop up in other years after a fire. And we see this in a number of species, Apiastrum, Charostevia. A lot of things will take advantage of the burned area, but they're not restricted to it. And so you'll find them often in years after the fire. And then we even have some species that will live in the understory of the chaparral or the species. Very few, they're usually very good, diminutive species like this uh, Trypodanus here. Uh, Trypodanus? I think that's right. Um, but there are a few of these things that will grow in the understory. They're very diminutive. But by and large, uh, the uh, majority of species are going to be in open areas and mostly after fire. Now, when I was a kid, and this isn't me when I was a kid, this is actually my son, um, everybody, we were told that these seeds were able to tie their germination to post-fire conditions because they were like these uh, members of the Fab A seed family, the legume family, which are noted for having hard seeds that require heat to trigger germination. And so we were always told that the only way these things could germinate is by the heat of the fire. And this would be a typical example of one of these seeds here. Very shiny uh, seed coat uh, with wax on it. And if you do a cross-section through that seed, they have a very thick layer of cells at the top, which basically make them water impermeable. The heat of the fire breaks that layer and allows them to take in water and they germinate. I was always told that's how all these species uh, were uh, are triggered to germinate after fire. But over the years, I worked on a number of species along with students at Occidental. For about 10 years, we worked on germination uh, post-fire species to look at other possible triggers to germination. Here's one that has a very different trigger. This is a species of Basilia that is common after fire. If you look at it in cross-section, it doesn't look anything like the seed of uh, anything of Fabaceae. Uh, this is the outer seed coat. There's no thick layer of cells. And in fact, if you soak them in water when they're dormant, they'll take water right up, but they won't germinate. Unlike things in the legume family, which simply won't take water up because they have to have the seed coat broken. These will take water up, but they just don't germinate. And what that tells us is there's some sort of endogenous uh, inhibitor uh, to pre prevent them from germinating. And we've looked at, over the years, of what it is in fire that could trigger their germination. And this is an illustration of six of the species uh, that we studied that showed their germination response. This axis here is percent germination. And this, these are different treatments. C is the control. We just water it and put it at uh, moderate conditions and look to see what germinates. These are ones we've given heat treatments like what you might give to a legume. And then these are, we've given charred wood or smoke, and or chemicals leached from them. And what we see is for the majority of these species that come up after fire, uh, they are completely dormant, or just about completely dormant under control conditions. Heat doesn't have much of a role at all. But you give them the right amount of smoke, 
and you get 100% germination. And we've studied this phenomenon in a number of species, and there are chemicals in smoke that will trigger germination. Chemicals appear to be different from one species to the next, but and sometimes they're uh, working at very low levels. For example, this species here is triggered to germinate by nitrogen dioxide at like 500 parts per million. And it simply doesn't get that chemical except after a fire. Now, one of the things I'll just mention briefly is this close relationship between fire and the life histories of the plants tells us that these species have been around in association with fire for a very long period of time. And just to give you some idea how long this has been, this is a geological time scale along this axis. This is going all the way back to the Eocene about 54 million years ago. And we know from the fossil record, all of these genera, which we find in chaparral, they're all present in the Eocene flora. So our chaparral shrubs are very ancient. They go back a very long period of time. Uh, maybe not always the same species we see today, but very similar species as today. The species that are really of interest because they show this germination response to fire are more recently derived, probably about 10 to 15 million years ago. But still, that's a very long period of time. And since these have germination strictly tied to fire, it tells us that fire, in all likelihood, was important all the way back to the Middle Miocene 15 million years ago. And we think the reason these developed is this is about the timing of the origin of our climate, the Mediterranean type climate of uh, winter rains and summer drought. Now, in addition to these annuals that have uh, seeds that stim are stimulated by fire, we have a lot of perennials, geophytes in particular, that come up after fire, and none of them are coming up from seeds. Pardon? A geophyte is something that has a bulb or a corn underground. And a couple examples you may be familiar with, one of them is this plant, Zygodinus, or sometimes called death Comet. And it also has a new name, and I don't remember what that new name is. But if you spend any time outside at all, you definitely recognize this, which is what? Mariposa lilies. And this genus Calicortis, very large in the state, lots of species in chaparral, and you'll see Calicortis coming up after the fire. These are not coming from seeds that uh, germinated. They're coming from the bulbs that were underground, and then they were, are just stimulated to germinate, probably by the high light and temperatures and ash produced after a fire, but not from seeds. And in fact, none of these plants that are perennial herbaceous perennials come from seed after fire. Almost all of them are coming from uh, uh, re-sprouting from underground walls. And here's another couple herbaceous perennials you'll see after fire. Uh, different delphinium cardinalis and this delphinium probably perii uh, will re-sprout after fire, but they're not coming back from seed. Now what does the behavior of a fire do to this response of the chaparral. The newspapers often will talk about this is a really high intensity or high severity fire and therefore it's likely to be a catastrophe for the vegetation. Turns out that's not the case at all. And this is some work we did over the years looking at measures of fire severity along this axis and then looking at things like species richness in the first year and woody cover in the first year, total plant cover in the first year and then in the second year. And by and large, what we find is fire severity is not very important in terms of recovery. These plants can withstand very severe fires that are very high intensity, and yet they'll still recover quite well. So just because it looks like it was a very severe fire, uh, it doesn't mean that there's anything to be concerned about in terms of regeneration of the plants. They, are well adapted to these uh, sorts of conditions. Now, what they will respond to is rainfall. If you have a very dry year, the first year after fire, uh, here's an example where 60% normal precipitation, you don't see this proliferation of uh, 
uh, species after fire. And that's largely because when it's a low rainfall year, the uh, main things you'll see are the re-sprouts from the shrubs. And very often the seeds won't get enough rain to germinate. If you have a very high rainfall year, sometimes even if it's in the second year, then you get a proliferation of growth. So if you're concerned about what is it that's going to affect the recovery, it's going to be much more tied to precipitation than it is to the severity of the fire. They can take high severity fires. They can't take uh, droughts very well in terms of recovery. So to just summarize then, these plants are adapted, uh, and it's important to realize they're not just adapted to fire, they're adapted to a very specific fire regime. And that regime involves high intensity fires, massive landscape burns, and most importantly, fire return intervals that are not real frequent. Fire return intervals historically in these <laughs> landscapes probably range from 30 to 130 years. And the, a far bigger threat to this landscape is frequent fires. And I'll touch on that a little bit uh, towards the end. So we can summarize the recovery. Yeah? Um, I just had a question about precipitation. Does a below average precipitation year effectively cap the uh, rejuvenation potential for an area? Or can that be made up later on? If there's a dry year, a series of dry years, and then a wet year, can that area still come back to the extent that it would have if there was a wet year immediately following a fire? Well, I have seen areas where that's happened and it has come back to the <coughs> Now, there likely are effects. Almost certainly the pattern of rainfall from year to year will have effects. We just haven't studied it closely enough. But I have seen areas where it's been very dry the first year and over time it ultimately came back just fine. So there's a good potential for that. Now, the important thing I think to understand about the recovery in uh, these landscapes, it's what uh, I like to call endogenous recovery. In other words, it comes from material that's inside the system. Seeds in the soil are re-sprouts. And it's important to keep that in mind because what is not important in terms of recovery of this vegetation is colonization from outside the landscape. Very little of what comes back after fire is going to come from colonization of seeds flowing in. Almost all of it's going to come from uh, material that's inside. Now, what about other critters out there? For a long time, I used to end my talk just talking about the endogenous recovery of plants. Inevitably, somebody would say, what about the animals? And so finally I decided I better go learn a little bit about the animals. <laughs> and recently we did a synthesis of everything that's known about animal recovery after fire. And it's really interesting because they recover somewhat differently than plants, not too surprisingly. But what's interesting about it is the type of fire behavior can also affect them much more so than it affects uh, plants. I like to think of animals and everything from insects, <laughs> snakes, rodents, uh, larger mammals and birds as comprising several different uh, recovery responses. Insects, in a way, are a lot like plants. They recover endogenously. Insects will uh, lay eggs, and those legs or pupae will go into the soil and stay there. And so when the fire goes through, they will recover from propagules that are already on the site. So in that way, they're a lot like plants. But not all animals are like that. Um, for example, some animals do what I like to call shelter in place. Snakes, for example, can shelter in burrows underneath the uh, fire. Rodents uh, can also burrow, uh, get into burrows. But they also will hide out in rock outcrops. So rocky areas provide shelters for these species. Uh, and sometimes unburned patches of vegetation will act as refugia, like this uh, patch of area here. So those animals are dependent upon the refugia present to survive fire. And the types of fires that burn will have a big impact. For example, any animal that spends its time goes into a burrow, it's going to be affected by the speed of the fire. Now, a fast-moving Santa Ana fire uh, looks very fierce, but it's actually very good for those animals in burrows. 
because when it moves through fast, uh, it's past the site before it's had time to uh, uh, take away all the oxygen in the burrows. It's the lower intensity surface fires that move slowly through a landscape that are likely to kill things uh, in burrows. Now, the animals like uh, birds and um, man, uh, larger mammals, they generally have only one uh, course, and that is to flee. And if they flee the site, then they have to recolonize. And the biggest threat to these animals is what is happening on the landscape in terms of human development. Because on landscapes that are highly fragmented, where uh, burned areas are adjacent to developments, that has big impacts on safe sites for those animals to flee to. And so the structure of the landscape, you have to look at it at a much bigger scale, what the structure of the landscape looks like will have a big impact on how well those birds and mammals are able to recover after the fire. Now let's shift to people and talk about uh, management and the, the uh, impacts of fires on animals, or excuse me, on people. Um, and there's two real, there's two ways to look at management. And I'm going to focus largely on short-term post-fire management. Uh, but uh, at the end, I'll, I'll address just a little bit about longer-term management uh, aspects. In terms of properties adjacent to burn areas, the primary risk is usually due to erosion coming off the slopes. You get rid of the plants that are holding the soil, and uh, you'll lose debris coming down the slopes. And these sites very often need active management to keep that uh, soil from destroying homes. Now, the wildlands as a whole um, are not necessarily at risk. And in fact, most managers and scientists today will tell you after a fire, the best thing to do for the landscape as a whole is passive management. In other words, leave it alone and it'll come back on its uh, own. Now, for a long time, that wasn't the case. Uh, for a long time, there was a campaign after every fire to take bags of rice seed, fly out over the burned area, drop the rice seed on the areas because uh, managers felt like they were going to prevent erosion because these grass seeds would grow up and they would hold the substrate. It turns out very few managers will do that anymore because we have good evidence that it doesn't work. And why doesn't it work? It doesn't work because in order for grasses to uh, uh, grow and protect the soil, you need a, a precipitation regime that sort of looks like this. In other words, gentle early fall rains causes the seeds to germinate. Those germ seeds grow roots and they hold the substrate. So when a bad storm comes, it prevents erosion. But if you've lived in Southern California very long, you know our rain doesn't come like that. It's like all of a sudden in December, we have this massive storm that lasts for four days. And what we found is under our precipitation regime, most of the seeds that are planted after fire are just washed down the slope and they don't contribute to recovery at all. And this is just some data that we collected a number of years ago after the big fire down in Laguna in 1993. Uh, and this is just looking at recovery of the native species here, annuals, perennials, shrubs, suppressants, versus the exotic seeded species. The bottom line is, is we get much more regeneration from the natives than we ever get from what's seeded on the site. And so as a general rule, you'll find very few managers that will encourage you to seed after a fire. Now, you will find lots of politicians that tell you to do that <laughs> because they're at a loss of what to tell people. But managers, by and large, no longer recommend seeding after a fire. Now, there's good reasons for not seeding also because of the impact it has on uh, our native flora and the introduction of exotic species. And this uh, species here, black mustard, is a good illustration. Black mustard, 100 years ago, in the late 20s and early 30s, was the main species that the Forest Service seeded on slopes in the Angeles Forest after fire. 
And they continued to do this until the orchard growers down in the valley started complaining because they were getting all this mustard coming up in their orchard because the seeds were all washing down into the orchards. And so the Forest Service stopped uh, seeding with mustard. And it's what I like to think of as an illustration of the Severide Principle. And those of you who maybe are old enough might remember a uh, newscaster named Eric Severide. And Eric Severide used to always have this phrase. He would say, most problems begin as solutions. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of the short-term emergency response, seeding seems to have very limited effectiveness. But it doesn't mean there are no options. The options that are uh, shown to be most effective are physical barriers to uh, uh, the erosion problem. And there's two types of barriers that people depend upon. Managers will use barriers that prevent soil erosion. And these are things like taking bales of hay, scattering them across the hillside. And that hay uh, actually dampens the impact of the raindrops and reduces erosion. And it appears to be fairly effective. One of the downsides of using hay bales on the slopes is they very often are contaminated with exotic species, and so you very often can bring in uh, exotics. Uh, the, uh, there are other uh, approaches that you use, for example, on roadsides. Um, Caltrans very often will use mats of jute, and jute is this fibrous uh, material that they'll throw down on these jute uh, pads on the slope. That also slows down the erosion on the slopes. That seems to be uh, the most effective way to reduce erosion. But if you don't have the option of reducing erosion, the other possibility is producing barriers which divert soil erosion away from homes. So for example, putting some sort of barrier like a K-rail on a slope and have it divert the erosion away from a home is also another effective way, but probably the best thing is to just prevent the soil from eroding to begin with. Now, let's shift to uh, long-term sustainable management. When I look at a slope like this in burned, I see two threats. Now, the obvious threat, and this is what managers will see when they look at a slope like it's erosion. We're concerned about those people who live at the bottom. When I see a slope like that, I have another concern. And that is, what is the long-term impact going to be? Because if we see a large area that is burned, one of the biggest concerns should be is how do we keep fire out of there long enough for the vegetation to recover so that we don't lose the vegetation. And so the big concern in the long term is how do we keep fire out of these systems until it's had time to regenerate. And this is an illustration of the problem. This is an area east of uh, San Diego, a little community called Alpine. And Alpine, this entire area here east of Alpine, burned in 1970 in what was called the Laguna Fire. Very important fire because this is the fire that got me started in fire ecology. Then in 2001, this portion here uh, burned in the Viejas fire. And you can see that it's regenerating here by um, native shrubs. This portion here burned a second time in 2003. And we don't see any natives at all in here. This is all exotic annual grasses, red brome in particular. So in other words, What's different about this site is it burned twice in two years. And when you get a fire regime that's that close together, the native species just can't handle it. But the exotic alien grasses love short fire return intervals. They're, that's what they're designed to do. Yeah. How long was this picture taken after that 2003 fire? <coughs> that was taken, I think, in about 2005. Wow. Yeah. So. Now, this is a big concern anymore because we're getting lots of big fires. And this is an illustration from San Diego County. You may remember in 2003, we had this massive cedar fire. And we also had one down by the border here, the Otai fire. And then we had one up here uh, by Vista. 
But then in 2007, the whole thing started all over again. We had several major fires in 2007, which are illustrated in the yellow. And what's important here is you see this area of overlap where a large portion of the 2007 fires burned into the 2003 fires. In other words, these landscapes, and when you add them up, these uh, three uh, areas, about 60,000 acres burned after just four years uh, from the 2003 fire. And that represents a major threat to those landscapes because the native species simply are not adapted to that frequency of fire. Yeah. Uh, before when you talked about uh, fire starting from natural causes of man and man, uh, it does, if you look way back before man was a thing, was the spacing of the fire that that did not ha happen often, that the fires were so close together? Yeah, if you look at lightning fire distribution <clears throat> and frequency in the state, what you see is lightning tend to be, tends to be distributed uh, fairly frequently in the mountains, but you get down in the coast, and they're very infrequent. For example, Santa Monica Mountains uh, National Recreation Area has been keeping records on <coughs> fires for the last 50 years. In that period, they've only had two lightning ignited fires. So we believe that lightning ignited fires were not all that frequent, and that the natural regime was probably on the order of about 30 years to maybe 130. Years. The short interval fires are largely attributable to man. On these landscapes. When you get into the high elevation forests, you get a lot of lightning and you can get them uh, in on those landscapes. Now this is an illustration from the Santa Monica Mountains of what happens in the landscape when it gets too many fires in a short period of time. This is uh, uh, the Tango Canyon, I believe. And this is an area that hasn't burned in 30 years and this is fairly dense, typical chaparral vegetation. This is a portion of that landscape that's burned three times in 12 years. And what's happened is we pipe converted it from dense chaparral to uh, mostly exotic grasses with mostly Velocal or rhino or laurel leaf sumac that's able to re-sprout. And this has happened a lot in, um, in the LA basin. In fact, there was an old book where somebody was talking about this pattern here in Sunland and talked about what he called the leopard spotting of the hills, which he described as these the laurel leaf sumac patches. When you get too many fires over a short period of time, you decimate most of the shrubs. The only things that can survive are very vigorous reef sprouters like laurel leaf sumac. And then it's all filled in with these exotic grasses. Now, this is a concern for a lot of reasons. As a biologist, I'm concerned because we've changed the, the conservation value of the landscape from mostly native species to mostly non-native species. But I'm also concerned as an ecologist about what happens to those slopes after fire. These slopes here can handle rain very well and they uh, stabilize the slopes. These landscapes here with grasses, grasses have very fine fibrous roots. They simply don't hold the slope. So it's exacerbated the problems with erosion, uh, other impacts of this type conversion is that these uh, grasses can extend the length of the fire season. In the Santa Monica Mountain, landscapes like this usually have a fire season of about four to six months. Much of the year, they simply don't burn very well. But you type convert it to this and you have a 12-month fire season. So you greatly <coughs> increase the frequency of fires. And then there's all kinds of impact in terms of the future and concerns over uh, carbon storage and whatnot. This landscape is storing much more carbon than this landscape here. Now, let me just raise a few other discussions, uh, questions, and because I'm not going to go into them in a lot of detail, I think I've already talked way too much. But just to raise some issues if you would like to delve into them uh, more. One of the issues that, of course, is of interest to people in terms of saving their homes is how much clearance do we need around homes? And the state now, or at least most counties in the state, require a 100-foot clearance around homes. Now, actually, the term clearance is really a misnomer because they don't actually require you to do this, to clear everything off. They just require you to reduce the amount of fuels. And there are prescriptions where you can reduce the 
maybe fuels down to maybe 30% cover and still produce a fire safe landscape. So you don't actually have to clear everything off like the terminology implies. But there are other people There are other people who don't feel like 100 feet is enough. This is a, a home I saw out in Ramona, and they wanted to do a 300-foot clearance around their house. And that's an awful lot of clearance. And so one question people have is, how useful is that to saving your homes? And we've collected a little bit of evidence for that. We looked at aerial photography of, air, of homes burned in San Diego County. And we looked at the amount of clearance around the homes of burned homes and then ones adjacent that didn't burn. And what we found is areas that had 0 to 25 foot clearance lost a greater proportion, a greater proportion of those homes were lost by fire. Uh, and it dropped significantly all the way down to 75 foot clearance. So clearance up to 100 feet does have some significant effect on reducing losses from fire. That's important to realize, but it's also important. <laughs> I think this has been set so that I have to finish quickly. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to meetings where they actually tie the slides so that you actually have to finish. <laughs> but here's an interesting point about the uh, distance around homes. You can get clearance all the way to 300 feet, and there's no significant change from 100 feet. And that's important to keep in mind that the clearance doesn't necessarily improve the chances your home will survive. But it, equally important is to think about what is the impact on the landscape. Because when you go from 100 foot clearance to 300 foot clearance, you're taking much more of the natural landscape uh, away. And in this environment where populations are growing, and we're expected in the next 30 years to increase by 50% population, when you start increasing homes and populations, and you start increasing uh, the distance you're clearing, you lose lots of natural resources. And this is just an illustration of roughly how much of the wildland of San Diego has been lost by 2010 due to 100 foot clearance. This is what would happen by 2050. We're going to lose maybe 35% of the open space due to clearance. Uh, and, but if we were to increase it to 300 feet or 90 meters, by 2050, we predict we could lose 60% of our open space just due to clearance. So it's important to keep in mind when people say it's more effective to clear more land, <coughs> the important question is to ask, well, is it cost efficient? Is it, does the benefit outweigh the cost? And the costs are not just the amount of money it takes to do the clearance, but the loss in natural resources. And at the present, it doesn't look like increasing beyond 100 feet gets you anything. Now, why do some homes burn? Yeah? Is there a, some sort of safety factor for the firefighters fighting fires? There's large 100, well, well, if you're going to fight a fire, you always want the most clearance possible. As a general rule, firefighters seem to be pretty comfortable with 100 foot clearance. Yeah. So isn't, isn't all that clearance also provide greater opportunities for a type conversion? Yeah. yeah. I didn't get into all the potential negative impacts, but you clear 300 feet, you leave much more space for exotic grasses. And those exotic grasses are highly flammable. Most fires start at the wildland urban interface due to people. So you increase clearance, you potentially are going to exacerbate problems. There are a lot of things that need to be uh, considered when you're doing things like increasing clearance. It's not just all beneficial. There are downsides. <coughs> That's why I think it's always important to think in terms of the cost versus the benefit. And right now, we don't see a lot of benefit from 300 feet, and we see lots of potential costs. Now, here's another interesting thing about why some homes burn and others don't. This is another study we did where we took the homes at the Wildland Urban Interface in San Diego. We did a Google Earth image of those homes before the fire. And then we tallied a lot of characteristics of homes that burned after the fire or that burned from the fire versus homes that didn't burn. And some of the things we looked at was the amount of clearance around the house, 
uh, the amount of tree canopy overlap over the house, um, and various other characteristics of those homes. The only thing that we found a really significant effect on was tree canopy cover over a house. And we believe the reason tree canopy cover over a house uh, makes those homes more susceptible to burning is not because the tree carries the fire into the home. Most homes do not burn because the fire front burns up to the yard, ignites trees, and they burn the house. Most homes burn because embers are blown in away from the uh, house and they land on flammable material on the roof. And if you have a tree overhanging your roof, it drops litter on the roof and you greatly increase the chance your home will burn. And the nice thing about knowing that is it's a highly tractable problem. You can just plan on going out every summer and clearing the dead litter off your roof, out of the gutters, and there's every possibility you're greatly going to enchant your, your, increase your chance of your house surviving. And then lastly, here's a little bit of good news. Now, if you want some good news. <laughs> Global warming. And how is that going to impact our fires in the future? Lots of discussion of that, both in the media and in the scientific literature. This is a summary of studies that we've uh, just finished looking at the last 100 years of climate variation from winter, spring, summer, and fall, fall throughout the state. And I've summarized it down just to two areas. The Sierra Nevada, which is higher elevation, mostly conifer forests, versus Southern California, <coughs> Chaparral. What we found consistently is <coughs> we see a very strong climate signal in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Spring temperatures, this is temperature here, as spring temperatures go up and from one year to the next, more fire activity. Same with summer temperatures. In other words, temperature is really important in terms of determining fire behavior in those forests. In the southern part of the state, we don't see any effect in temperature. Now, why is that? I think it primarily has to do with temperatures here are always hot enough to cause <coughs> fire events. And if you look, for example, the maximum temperature in the summer in the Sierra Nevada, it's about the same as the minimum temperature in Southern California. In other words, in our part of the world, temperatures are always hot enough to cause big fires. And that as temperatures warm, we see no reason to think that, temp that it's going to cause an increase in uh, fire problems in this part of the world. Now, why is it that, um, what is it that call controls fires in this part of the United States? It has to do with humans when they ignite the fires. So in, in our part of the world, a much bigger threat to uh, future fires is not going to be increases in temperatures. It's going to be increases in population. 99% of our fires are started by people. We're going to get a 50% increase in population in the next 30 years. That's a much bigger concern. And so in my mind, in some parts of the world, like Southern California, there's been way too much focus on climate change and not enough focus on other global changes that are going on. And, and certainly population growth, in my mind, is one of the biggest concerns that we ought to have. And I'll just end it there and open it up if people have questions and discussion. Um, regarding reseeding, you talked about rise um, and uh, you know, you're really more kind of proactive on reseeding in these burnt areas. But what about uh, species like the buckwheats um, that are are primarily reseeders? Um, are you against that as well, scattering the buckwheats and things like that? You just want it to just... Well, there might be places where that's advisable. Mm -hmm. But by and large, what we find is if you don't do anything, the slopes come back just fine. Now, the number one negative against seeding, even native species, <coughs> is every slope you look at has a different composition. And that composition evolved over a very long period of time to select out those species best adapted to that slope aspect, that slope incline, substrate type. When you start scattering one species all across the landscape, you really are upsetting that community composition. Now, if there was some particular reason, for example, Caltrans, when they scrape off the slope, will plant, will scatter buckwheat seeds. 
and that's very good at stabilizing the slopes, and it's much better to have a native species on those slopes than anything else. And they're not going to come back on their own. So in that case, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I have a question about the firefighting operations. The, uh, the use of bulldozers, they seem to leave some very long-term scars. Uh, and it seems to me that the use of a bulldozer is really more towards the, you know, the low intensity fires that they have in the north. The fire break out here is useless, in my opinion. I don't know if you talk to fire fighters, why they seem to have to do it. Well, <clears throat> I, I agree. I'm not necessarily uh, in a big fan of doing that. I think part of the reason, well, part of the reason they do it, I always, always think of this uh, scene from this movie my son loved called Van Helsing. And Van Helsing you know, is Dracula, and he has his sidekick, uh, Igor. And there's a scene where there's a big uh, screen, and you can see a shadow, and Igor is beating this wolf with a whip. And Igor comes out, and Dracula says, Igor, why do you beat that wolf so? And Igor says, Master, it's what I do. <laughs> and that's part of, the, part of what's going on, is people have certain techniques that they can use. And sometimes they will apply them simply because that's what they've always done. Because there hasn't been a clear study of how effective they are. There are a lot of these questions that haven't been addressed. They haven't been studied adequately. And I, uh, I think there needs to be a lot more because there are negative impacts. For example, the Zaka fire, you might remember from 2006 or 7, in Santa Barbara, huge fire. They put in 400 miles of tractor line around that uh, area. And then they have to go back and revegetate all that landscape. Plus, they probably brought in invasive species by doing it. And certainly one can ask the question whether that was really necessary. The problem is, is you know, there's only, only so much money to go around and we don't have money to study everything like that. But I think there is reason to question it. Now, there are proactive things that people have done. For example, I'm on the Technical Advisory Committee for the Nature Reserves of Orange County. And one of the things this organization has managed to do is develop a fire management plan for the nature reserves. And one of the things that was done in that plan was to map out those resources we didn't want destroyed during a fire due to firefighting activities. And so we developed very careful maps, went over them with firefighting agencies, got them on board that they could do other things. And so before the fire ever occurred, they knew where they should and shouldn't go. And that's probably the most proactive thing you can do with fire agencies, is to work with them ahead of time to see what is really critically important, what's strategic, because very often these things are done, and they're not done with a lot of strategy. I mean, yeah. a good illustration is the fire break or fuel break program in the Angeles Forest. They put fuel breaks, where do they put them? They put them everywhere. <laughs> And there's lots of evidence. We've done studies on fuel brake effectiveness, and there's a lot of evidence that fuel brakes oftentimes are not very effective. They need to be thought of strategically. And there are some places they can be helpful, and other places they're not. So there needs to be a strategy of where you do it and where you don't do it. And, and part of it has to do with the philosophy. The uh, philosophy in the past has often been one in which Resources were acknowledged as important, but fire hazards was also important. And the, uh, and so, but when it came, push came to shove about which do you protect first, fire or resources or hazards, uh, it was always the resources lost out. But there really needs to be a change from this hierarchical thinking that hazard always preempts resources and think in terms of the cost and benefits of all of these things. If you're going to put a fuel break in somewhere, there ought to be good evidence that it will be strategic and effective. And from our work, we found that fuel breaks are really only effective where they are 
uh, used by firefighters to protect homes. In other words, around the communities are where they're most effective. And fuel breaks on the greater landscape, far less effective. Yeah. For those areas like you showed in Alpine that have experienced multiple fires in a short amount of time, what's the long term outcome? Is that really a permanent uh, change, at least in our lifetime? Or is well, well, nothing in life is permanent. Right, of course. Um, <coughs> there's every possibility if they don't experience repeat fires over the next 20 years, they will gradually get recolonized um, and uh, be replaced by chaparral. The problem is that the grasses that get in there, they have a positive feedback on fires. The more grasses you get, the more likely you get a fire. And the more fires you get, the more grasses you get. So uh, the problem is they're not likely to go a long time without fire. I'm trying to wrap my brain around what they said in the last few years about this waxy surface that kind of starts and is created by the fire at the top and then really kind of gets underneath and the whole thing slumps down the hill. And does that then take all of the seeds that are in that area and then you don't get? Any yeah, it's called green? soil wettability. And frankly, I think it's uh, very overblown in terms of its importance. First thing to understand about non-wettable soils due to lapses is they're there all the time. If you go out and collect some soil underneath shrubs and take it into the lab and drop water on it, you'll find the water just beats up. These so the soils are just inherently non-wettable. And it takes a lot to get them to absorb water. Now, it appears that under certain burning conditions, that layer might increase. Um, but I see you know, all the work that's been done on it, it's all been done in a lab. And I don't, frankly, I don't think it's it's one of the issues that one needs to be that concerned about. In large part because there probably isn't anything you can do about it anyways. The soils are just inherently non wettable But I've never seen any clear evidence that you have massive debris flows after fire due to <coughs> non wettable layers. Yeah? I wondered if you could go back to that slide that was before your section on the bulbs where you were talking about the development of um, chaparral, the uh, fire regimes, and you had, it had the Miocene and the Eocene. And I just wondered if you could elaborate a little bit more on that, because I, um, I wasn't clear on how that yeah, affected sure the obligation. Yeah. I'll do it yeah, efficient. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. around the landscape, interspersed with woodland and more easy environments. 
and that fires were present but not predictable. And certainly Circle Carpus would fit in a model like that because what's different about Circle Carpus? It's our only chaparral shrub that has wind dispersed seeds, which is what you might expect if it was in a landscape with widely disjunct patches. Uh, we know those go all the way back to 50 million years ago in the fossil record, pretty much in contemporary forms. Uh, they were given different names, largely because Dan Axelrod always felt like if it was in the fossil record, it had to have a different name. You couldn't call it anything that was contemporary. Uh, our our disciples and see you this, we are pretty confident came about much later, middle Miocene. Adnostoma, I sort of snuck it in there in parentheses because we have no clue when Adnostoma came about. <laughs> it's a really interesting plant, and it tells us a lot about the fossil record. Adnostoma has never been found in the fossil record anywhere. Now here's the most ubiquitous shrub in Chaparral, and we've never seen it. And I think the reason is, is because our fossil record is laid down in wetlands and riparian areas, and you don't get fossils laid down in dry land areas, unless it happens to be a volcanic eruption that lands on a dry land area. So in general, I think Adnostoma was used in such arid environments, it just never got deposited in the record. And the OR means obligate re-sprouter? OR means obligate re-sprouter, yeah. These are all more or less obligate re-sprouters. You see a little plus or minus next to Vermont, the dead run and area. That's because occasionally you will see a seedling. But it's not their predominant mode of regeneration after fires. Yeah. When you were talking about bulb, I don't know much about bulb. How do those bulbs get there? Were they bulbs from which plants grew before the fire and then after the fire also? How do the, the bulbs get there? Well, it tends to be confusing sometimes when we talk about how these plants recover after fire and say some things come from re-sprouts and some come from seeds. That doesn't mean to say the ones that come from re-sprouts never produce seeds. They do produce seeds. Uh, it's just those seeds don't germinate after fire. So, for example, the uh, Mariposa lily, they will re-sprout from a bulb, and they'll flower the first year, they'll produce seeds, and then sometimes you'll see seedlings in the second or third year after a fire. So they reproduce from seeds, they spread from seeds, uh, but in terms of the response to fire, those seeds never go dormant in the soil. They're short-lived seeds, they germinate, uh, in the first year or two after dispersal. And so when a fire comes, there's no seed there. And they just come back with bulbs. The bulbs you're talking about were there and they, they, they germinated before the fire also? Yes. Okay. Those bulbs we know can sit dormant under the shrubs for decades. Yeah. I just have one more question about that. So they think that fire frequency increased in the Miocene and the Pliocene, and that's why you have the obligate, you see the obligate seed sprouters afterwards and that and that those two well that's what i think okay okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay i'm not so sure everybody thinks that um but no we're currently working on a paper about this because uh there's been a lot of controversy about the origins of the mediterranean type climate uh, -huh. uh dan axelrod who uh did more for paleoecology than anybody in california uh, did something like 95 fossil records uh, or fossil collections from different sites. Um, he was adamant fire was never part of these landscapes, ever. And in fact, he didn't even believe that things with serotonous cones like knot cone pine and lodge pole pine were a result of fire. He believed fire was totally anthropogenic and never existed in the past. Um, so, hmm. He wouldn't have agreed, but he's gone. <laughs> well, let's thank John for being here. <laughs> I have to say, it might be a series that we didn't want to hold, but that was the first time I've ever heard good news about climate change. <laughs> As well. So this is the first in our series of Launching the Fire Regeneration. Um, and that's particularly now you understand why we're using, using the word regeneration, that it'll come back on its own. 
largely without our help. Um, we are going to continue this series. Stay tuned for future people and dates. We're working out the dates and the speakers right now, but between now and the end of the year, I think we're going to have a few, few talks. But um, Liz Lily Singer, who is our uh, Director of Adult Education, is going to tell you about our next upcoming event. So we have, uh, isn't it going to be a great spring? Wildflowers. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, we're going to see rebirth. Uh, yeah. And we can feel confident. The scientists make us Anyway, thank you, John. It's great. So um, what we have coming up that is scheduled on September 30th, Josh Link, who's in the back of the room, who is a wonderful um, teacher here on many subjects. He had been scheduled to do a, a talk called Sustainable Slopes, a one-hour talk. And we've lengthened it to two hours. So Josh is going to bring in a lot of pre- and post-fire information for people in, in fire prone areas. So that is happening on September 30th from 1.30, uh, I think it's from 2 to 4. And in my little brain, I'm sitting here and I don't think we have, we're charging for that. So for you guys, it's free. So wait, wait a couple of days to sign up for it. We'll fix the event right so you can get in for free on that because we really want you to attend. And then the other things that are happening, um, uh, we have uh, queries out to some really amazing people. And for sure, we'll do uh, in the near future something on invasive plants. And John touched on that. Um, how important it is to not let the invasives come in and colonize before the natives have a way to come back. And that's just, these are proactive things that we can do. That's what's so neat, is that you cannot plant the bad pests. So that's why you say to go plant the pests with you and um, know that we are here to help you identify things as they come up. And it's kind of hard to identify those little grasses when they pop up, but we'll do our best. But to let you know what is probably the native and what isn't. So feel free to use us as a resource for that. Um, so one talk with Sabrina Drill, um, it's going to be about invasive plants. And then the other one, I don't know what Rick calls he's going to do. Rick is his sidekick and their friend and an expert on, on fire and the chaparral. And he's going to come up from San Diego County and do something for us. And uh, whatever he does will be It'll be great. <laughs> and then uh, Marty Bitter, who is with San Juan Mountains Recreation Area um, and works with John in the California Fire, fire Consortium. Um, she is, we're going to rope her into doing something. Um, we're hoping to get uh, an assistant fire chief who's working with us. It's amazing, maybe to do a presentation. And what else have we got coming in? Not very much, but we have a whole list. We've got a whole bunch of great people, and it's just a matter of juggling dates with them. Most of them will be on Saturday afternoons. Um, look at your La Tony Canyon um, Community Association Facebook page for announcements and also on our um, uh, website. And then Vickery is really great. She's been putting it onto other local sites. Yes? Um, may I scan the, uh, the paperwork that you gave today to send to the La Tony Canyon Association? It's yeah. actually on our website. Okay. Perfect. Is this yes. yes. It's on our website. If you look at the website, the website will say uh, a response to the fire for the campaign. Cool. And then it, it, please do, please do circulate it as much as you can. Thank you. And um, also, um, we are going to be developing some lists for you, but know that anything will burn if it gets hot, especially a fire like this. So don't think that a list of great plants for fire areas is going to solve your problems. It's just, you know, um, but it's something that people want. And I may have John get it before it goes out. But, but that's kind of, it's, it's the feeling that you can do something, but you know, when it gets like this, there's not much we can do except support the firefighters. So we have, we have a fire management demonstration garden, which um, is our newest garden, which is beyond the east sales yard. You go kind of through the grasses and across, and you can go up there. It's small, but it's growing. Um, and we've developed a small, uh, a seed mix of local Latino wildflowers and perennials that you could put on your own private property if you just feel like you have to do something. <laughs> <laughs> on a plane. These well, are for you to use on your property. On your property or you, know, you own the parking strip. Right. So, but don't put it on the slopes. We don't want it going up into the, the And on the trails and on the trails. trails. So this right. is just right. your house. And can you imagine if we got everybody to do the parking strips along the tuna? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's my dream. And Jenny Marvel, who is our seed program manager, has put this mix together. And it's specifically for people in this area. It's based on plants that are native to this area, local to the Verdugos. So it's a really special mix. And if you want to talk with Jenny about that, she's very happy to do that. We have <laughs> our response to the La Tuna fire and the don't plant the pest. But I really want to thank John again, who's the perfect person to talk to.
Yeah, I just mentioned if anybody has follow up questions that occurred, feel free to email me. I get tons of emails all the time. You can easily get it. Just Google my name, USGS. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.